Well, now that I've ranked two legislative bodies, it's time for me to step outside of that and move on to another branch of government. No, not the SCOTUS. I decided to save that for next year. We're going to talk about the executive branch, but not the executive branch at all the way at the top. We're going to talk about state executives, because let's be honest, governors are not really talked about that much. Now, I know what you may be thinking. Oh, actually, yes, they are. Um, can you name any governor outside of your home state and the three big states? Nope. No, you cannot, because they're really kind of irrelevant to your lives. But they should get credit where credit is due. They run a whole mini country. They're basically a practice run for the presidency. So I think it'll be in our best interest to look over 10 that I think are pretty good. Although don't expect it to be a recurring list series because I'll be honest, it was kind of hard to find these 10, sort of. And as we go through the list, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Now there really isn't any room for any other ground rules. So here are the top 10 best governors in US history, in my opinion. Number 10, Gifford Pinchot, Pennsylvania. Yeah, for all of those who've only read his name, it's not Pinchot, it's Pinchot. Just wanted to clear that up. Pinchot was a leading Republican progressive during the aptly named Progressive Era. His primary voting base was mostly farmers, workers, and women. He ambitiously led a plan to regulate Pennsylvania's electricity industry and also led to Pennsylvania getting a $6.7 million surplus. He also pushed for large state infrastructure programs, most famously the Pincho Roads. Another thing that's pretty notable for his tenure was that he was a huge environmentalist, much like Teddy Roosevelt, previously proving that in certain federal positions that he took. Though for his governorship, he translated that to pushing to expand Pennsylvania state parks. To be honest, there isn't much else to say about Pincho. He was pretty good. Let's move on. Number 9, Colbert Olson. Olson was sort of like what would happen if Upton Sinclair actually won the governorship of California, a race that was a bit of a doozy in and of itself, which we'll get to when we get to. But back to Olson, Olson had positioned himself to be a very notable leftist voice on the issues aligning himself with Franklin D. Roosevelt, which put him at odds with the conservative Republicans and conservative Democrats in the state legislature. He wanted to pass a statewide universal health care plan, they stopped him, he proposed a massive state budget, they cut $100 million out of it. Another reason that they probably hated him aside from his politics was the fact that he was actually California's first openly atheist governor, saying at his inauguration, God couldn't help me at all, and that there isn't such a person, I will affirm. Now you might say, well, why is he any higher? He sounds pretty cool. Well, when I said he aligned himself with Roosevelt, I do mean he aligned himself pretty well with Roosevelt, including supporting, in fact spearheading, the Japanese internment camps. And it's not like he was very vastly superior to any of the other individuals on this list, because they were able to do things that he wanted to do without interned Japanese people. Speaking of, number 8, Earl Warren. Yes, to a degree, the guy who beat Colbert was actually superior to him. He was a member of the now-dying progressive wing of the GOP, and used that to sort of build himself as a sort of unity kind of guy. And unlike the typical unity platitudes that most politicians do, this unity was actually beneficial. He ended the discrimination laws against indigenous people and Asians, also closing the camps down. Colbert didn't do that. He put a lot of funding to state colleges, ended California's anti-miscegenation laws, and, much like Olson, tried to give California a universal healthcare model. He also saw the conservatives in California like Nixon for what they were, and were not in their favor. Never thought I'd actually say this, but Warren actually did manage to bring big structural change. Number 7, Adley Stevenson, from one guy who lost a Dwight D. Eisenhower to another. You see, the thing you learn about the past is, unlike now, when it's like we have the lesser of two evils, Back then, we had the gooder of two goods. <laughs> Stevenson begun his career with promise because his gubernatorial campaign was actually seen as the thing that carried the state of Illinois to Truman. He did not wait too long to get to work, pushing to fix his state's highway system and fighting to fix corruption in his state government. He was also able to explain why he made a lot of decisions, even when the decisions weren't really in the interest of other politicians. For example, he vetoed a bill that would ban being part of subversive groups and would force all government employees to sign a loyalty oath, 
And when they said, What the heck, man? What, do you support the commies? He responded with a simple, Does anyone seriously think that a real traitor will hesitate to sign a loyalty oath? And, I know full well that this veto will be distorted and misunderstood. I know that to veto this bill in this period of grave anxiety will be unpopular with many, but I must, in good conscience, protest against any unnecessary suppression of our ancient rights as free men. He also had a good sense of humor when vetoing laws, such as when he vetoed a bill which would crack down on roaming cats, stating, It is in the nature of cats to do a certain amount of unescorted roaming. The problem of cat versus bird is as old as time. If we attempt to solve it by legislating, who knows but what we may be called upon to take sides as well in the age-old problem of dog versus cat, bird versus bird, or even bird versus worm. Overall, he was really popular. He seemed to do a fine job as governor. And I can totally see why the Democrats rigged it for him in 1952. Number 6. John Milliken Parker Parker was another typical progressive era type figure. He was literally so much after a majority of the bull moosers went to Charles Hughes he pushed for a no-nominee ticket with him as the vice presidential nominee rather than sheepdogging the progressives into one of the two major parties. And his tenure as governor of Louisiana was absolutely no exception to that. He fought for environmental conversation and against monopolies. He raised oil and gas severance taxes to finance public education in the state, and he actually tried to get the FBI to try and stop the KKK from spreading in Louisiana. Despite the fact that a lot of Southern Democrats were usually very friendly towards the KKK. On a similar note, he also pardoned two African Americans who were wrongly convicted of an axe murdering. Which again is a very large contrast to what a Southern Democratic governor in the 20s would do. An almost complete antithesis to what they would do in a matter of fact. Though apparently he did at one point start becoming an enemy to a well-known person in the state. But shh, Number 5. Robert M. LaFollette Sr. Now, I was originally going to put his son Fox in this position in order to prevent more repeats of the list, but let's be honest, if you're going to pick one LaFollette, you can't really beat Fighting Bob. I mean, he pushed for the Wisconsin idea, which was basically a mass wave of progressive reforms in the state. He implemented primary elections, created state income taxes, and tried to rein in the railroad monopolies. The last one especially put him at odds with conservatives across all the party lines, a thing that La Follette would pretty much be growing accustomed to. Although to be honest, I've talked about him enough, we should move on to people who I haven't talked about. Number 4, Terry Sanford, representing the good old Tar Heel State himself. Terry Sanford's main focus when elected was education. Well of course he did tackle these issues very well, he raised teacher pay by 22%, gave 33% of funds for instructional supplies, and increased library funds by 100%. That isn't the issue that Terry Sanford would become most well known for. You see, being the 60s, there was a lot of racial conflict going on. One side believed that African Americans should be equal under the rights of the law due to the fact that they are human beings just like us. The other side believed that they deserved their second class citizenship. And it just so happened that that latter side was being led by a lot of southern democratic governors such as George Wallace. Getting to the point where the KKK felt that it was okay to just run amok in his state. Meanwhile, Sanford was vehemently opposed to Wallace and sought to try and rebrand southern democratic's governors, trying to show that they're not all racist rednecks basically being the only Southern Democratic governor that was actually taking their issues seriously, tackling their primary concerns via his aforementioned education programs, but also via a Great Society-esque poverty alleviation program called the North Carolina Fund, even going down to the most basic civility, rather than doing what the other Southern Democrat governors were doing and sicking police on protesters, Sanford would literally go to protesters and tell them point blank, what do you guys want? I'm here to listen. I'm your governor. This even led to Sanford running presidential campaigns against Wallace to again show not every Southern Democrat is Wallace. And personally, I'd say, yeah, he did a pretty good job showing that. Number three, Hiram Johnson. Now, Hiram is a bit interesting, and he thinks he's interesting enough that, spoilers, he's gonna get his own video all to himself. So, I probably won't go too in depth, although I probably will. Much like La Follette, his leading progressive reforms were pretty much standard for the era. You know, 
trying to combat railroad monopolies, specifically to try and regulate the power of the Southern Pacific Railroad, and instituting things like primary elections, but also the ballot initiative and the referendum and the recalls, which are actually kind of getting the notoriety in California again. Effectively turning California into the most democratic state of the union. Quite literally nowadays, but it's he also tried to build a viable left-wing alternative to the two-party duopoly in the United States. Of course, he'd be one of the three repeats from my Senate list. That's right, I said three. Number two, Huey Long. Now, I know Huey making it into the top ten senators list might be controversial, but making it the number two governor of the U.S. is probably very controversial. I know he's a lot more authoritarian than most folks that I'd consider liking, but a lot like other people in the world, you can't really deny the results that they actually brought to the table. Huey's whole thing was helping the poor and disadvantaged, and by golly, he sure did show it. He enacted a huge public works program that turned Louisiana from dirt roads to mass highways while employing thousands of people in his state. He instituted prison rehabilitation programs, as well as improving hospitals to better care for the mentally ill, and he instituted tax on oil that he used to give school books to all children in the state, increasing enrollment by 20% and having adult literacy programs that taught 100,000 adults how to read. While he did do a lot of things that were of course 100% him stroking his ego and being a sort of demagogue, like I mean I doubt building the Louisiana state capitol to be a skyscraper was very vital to him actually enacting his progressive legislation. But as Long would probably say, the ends justify the means. Now, a lot of people might see this and go, wait, who the heck can beat Huey Long? Well, number one, Floyd B. Olson. Now, as much as the rest of these people fought and faced a war on two fronts for the party establishments, Floyd here went the extra mile by not only going in a third party and actually winning, but also doing it in a third party that had basically been a dream for the United States to form for a while, but also a third party that was increasingly becoming a whole lot more socialist by the time he got in office. And unlike some other members of his party, he didn't run away. He embraced it wholeheartedly, stating, Now I am frank to say that I am not a liberal. I enjoy working on a common basis with liberals for their platforms, but I am not a liberal. I am what I want to be. I am a radical. Floyd began his career as an attorney that put the leaders of a conservative group that tried to bomb the house of a union leader behind bars, ergo making union leaders go, this guy, he's got our back. We should have his back too. Which makes sense given the fact that he wasn't just a union man, he was a wobbly. But he didn't slack when he got into office, no 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 no. He led on many progressive reforms, such as a progressive income tax, a social security program for the elderly, expanding the state's environmental conservation programs, guaranteeing equal pay for women, the right to collective bargaining, a system of unemployment insurance, and creating a state minimum wage. And as is pretty evident, he wanted to go further. He full on wanted to do state ownership of certain utilities, but his opponents were like, dude, come on, you're a socialist, which he was just like, you call it socialism? I call it cooperativism. Olsen got so prominent that many people wanted to carry him to a higher offices. People were pushing him to not only run for Senate, but also flat out run against FDR himself. But Olsen unfortunately died before he was able to do that. But it did show that he was a really popular governor and public official in a state. So yeah, those are the top 10 governors in my opinion. Do you have any governors that you think deserve a spot but didn't make the cut? Well, leave them in the comments. Or do you just want to join me and become Floyd Olsen stands? Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Twitter, join my Discord, or check my articles on the Independent Political Report.